ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 332. Science Faction, I call BS. So the last BS show... I have won. Yes. You, I, I mean, everyone you've won. I, Damien has literally never won. But that I one I gloriously really slammed him hard. You're, you're, I really won it. Yeah. You're, you're factually accurate. I've beaten Dr. Ava several times. Unfortunately, though, she did beat me last time. It's and true. And I discovered a new fetish. I like being dominated by a scientist. And in since this game. then, you've you've guaranteed that you will never not have that happen. Exactly. So I'm. So just you know, every time, unless you surrender, just know that every time you beat me, I'm just sitting here like with getting my getting some sort of sick sexual gratification. So play your game any which way you want, Dr. Ava. Do you want to take a shower when you get home, or do you want to win? Oh, and speaking of somebody who wants to win, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy, and with me is the unshowered man to my left, comedian Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how you doing? I don't shower because I am basting. <laughs> and our what? scientist of the afternoon, Dr. Ava. Dr. Ava, how you doing? I was pretty good until about 30 <laughs> seconds ago. Yeah, well, I believe the term he means is marinating. <laughs> Oh, I was basted, but yes, uh, marinating, yes. Yes, you say, I mean, you cover yourself in a rub and you hang out in the sauna for a half hour or so. <laughs> it was a Freudian slip. I was trying to tell them, don't tell them that you just inseminated yourself with the fucking baster. <laughs> and then, of course, that's the one thing I mentioned. All right, let's get right on to I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. All right, Echo BS is a game where I read four science news articles, some of which are real and some of which are BS, standing for bad science. They are all independent variables, meaning they could all be true, all be false, or any combination in between. Are you guys ready to play? I'm ready to be dominated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop basting in the corner. Mm. I've been a bad anti-science boy, and I need to be punished <laughs> with some hard facts. This is why Bed Bath & Beyond should never accept turkey baster returns from you. <laughs> like the like that new turkey baster feel. <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm debating on whether I should comment that I don't understand that joke or whether I should just like let it go. Bed Bath Beyond now has a sign up behind them that says like no turkey baster returns if fecal material is present. <laughs> <laughs> and Damien walks in with a huge box of turkey basters and slams them on the ground in anger. But I do that because I know that the technology to test for on the spot fecal contamination doesn't exist yet or certainly not in a Bed Bath and Beyond. Because if so, you'd have it at your own house. <laughs> All right, let's get on to article number one. A new paper came out this week detailing the best possible ways to torture African mole rats, including tactics such as pouring hydrochloric acid on them and injecting them with capsaicin. Damien, is this science or bad science? I should comment, by the way, capsaicin is what makes peppers hot. So it would, injecting it would cause an incredible amount of burning pain in your blood. Is there more than one type of naked mole rat or is just the African? There's multiple mole rats. Some of these were the naked mole rat type. Some of them were the non-naked mole rat type. The mm. more prudish mole rat, if you will. Why did you specifically say, is, this, is, this, is that your red herring? Like it huh. was actually the North American mole rat. I just said African mole rat. You know what? I am going to say because the mole rat is nature's scrotum. Uh-huh. Sure, the naked mole rat. And you can't do experiments on human subjects, even torturous experiments, if you're going to test to see what type of effect. A naked mole rat's the closest thing in nature to the human scrotum, so if you want to test the effects of testicular torture, you're going to have to do it on mole rats, so I could see this being science. That is absolutely reasonable. All right, and Dr. Ava. So wouldn't that be like just a really horrible way to torture anyone? anyone? Yes, totally. Yeah, it would be incredibly painful. So as somebody who has to go through IRBs mm -hmm. myself... On a regular basis, and find that already finds already that very excruciating and torturous. I can't. Uh, well, your I quite... IRB is, couldn't be that torturous. They didn't even inject you with capsaicin. <laughs> I don't think that's science. All right, and I was going to change my answer to bad science because the game respects game, and I think the naked mole rats have developed a fetish for torture, and I think. Oh, David needs to change his answer afterwards. Okay, fair enough. Uh -huh. Fair enough. I raised my hand before. <laughs> All right, article number two. New research shows that mutations in non-coding junk DNA can be the cause of ASD just as frequently as mutations in coding genes can. Damien, is this science or bad science? Now, I know that we share a common ancestor with trains, and that's like mostly in our junk DNA. So I'm going to say science. All right. And Dr. Ava? 
I think this is science because junk DNA is not really junk. All right. Article number three. New research suggests that different parts of your body follow their own circadian rhythms, including your liver that knows whether you're being exposed to light or not. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science because not only does my liver know when it's light or not, it knows when it's fucking party time. Just because you're drinking a lot? Yeah, it's actually it's actually weird. Like uh, my liver tells me I need to st- like, hey, it's nighttime. Day's over. It's yeah. nighttime. You need to start drinking, and it does it by making my hand shake. Interesting. And making me have to go to the hospital like within twenty four hours if I don't have a drink. Well, you know what they say: do what your liver tells you. <laughs> it's calling the shots. <laughs> All right, and Doctor Ava. I really am not sure. So, judging from everyone, and everything I know about Damien, I would hmm. say this is true, and I okay. can't elaborate here. Uh huh. You just know that his liver likes to party? It's not only the liver. Uh Uh-huh. But all the other... Elaborate. (laughs) I can't. (laughs) Um, But that's just anecdotal evidence. So I would say this is probably bad science. All right. (laughs) And lastly, article number four. Researchers have crossed a fungus with a spider's venom to try to kill mosquitoes. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. And I would have liked if people had found a way to give... Mosquitoes, fungal-based malaria, but um, oh, you you think also, we gave them malaria? I think you're like you give us this for mil- for a million years, we're giving it back to you. I wanted it to be us, but apparently it's spiders using fungus. <laughs> All right, and Doctor Eva. So I think this is science, except that it's not the case that they cross the fungus with the spider's ven- venom, but they cross the mosquito with the spider's venom to get rid of fungus. Could it possibly also be building off her answer uh-huh. and an answer from last week that the fungus was bitten by a radioactive spider and now that fungus is... Yeah, that's possible. That's, that's probably <laughs> a likely case. Yeah, totally. Uh, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new paper came out this week detailing the best possible way to torture African mole rats and included tactics such as pouring hydrochloric acid on them and injecting them with capsaicin. Both of you guys thought this was bad science and this one is... Science, they were exploring the amazing pain resistance of these animals that appear highly immune to most chemically induced types of pain. This is likely because the burrowing animals eat highly acidic tree roots and share their burrows with an ant that boasts a venomous and highly painful bite. So we're studying them to figure out what specific adaptations make them so pain resistant. Researchers were put to the task of figuring out how best to test their painlessness And these were some of the tactics. They found out exposing them to hydrochloric acid and injecting them with capsaicin were ways to test their pain resistance. Why? Yeah, and some of them had some pain, and you could tell because you would inject like their little paw with the capsaicin, and they would like nibble on it, like, oh, what the fuck's wrong with my foot? But some of them, including one of the variants in South Africa, literally had no impact, no effect whatsoever. They were essentially like putting wasabi on its eyeballs and like getting nothing. And what they realize is these creatures have evolved this because of the condition that they live in. And so they wanted to look at what was actually going on. So you're saying that if I raise my sons in an ant hill, then they will be a little bit less. That would be pain. too Lamarckian. I think you need to raise generations of children in that <laughs> ant hill. And then, yes, eventually the ones that bred were the ones that would not feel the most pain. Well, you'd have to have lots of children. And the children that bitch oh, no about the ant, ant hill the least would be, you'd have to breed them with other children who. So, So they found out that various species of mole rats have different mutations uh, that affect the ion channels that convey pain, and they basically essentially shut off or act really poorly in a lot of circumstances. So they have a reduced pain network that keeps them from feeling things the same way their cousins, which are the same size and same relation and same everything, would feel. Because when I play this game, I play the man. The question a bit, but I play the man mostly. I should have known what the answer was because you allowed me to change my answer to That's the That's true. Answer. That you is would true. not have allowed it the other way around. That, that is most likely true. And secondly, does the naked mole rat have a resistance to acid or is it just feeling the pain from acid? It's the pain. So uh, It'll still do the damage. Yeah, so hydrochloric acid will still cause damage, but the pain that the signals cause when your body's exposed to it aren't being transferred. Okay. Is it just chemical damage? Like yes. if I were to take a naked mole rat and put it in a bag and just beat the shit out yeah. of that bag, but with a comparable, beat, not with my human strength, but with a comparable naked mole, mole rat, rat beating strength? strength. Yeah. Follow, well, that's a follow-up study we're going to need to do. Would I have him like screaming like, stop, stop, the key is use to the get, acid. The key is to get another naked mole rat to hold his arms from behind and so you <laughs> could really wail on the torso without any blocking. Get some buff mole to yeah. work his gut. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What the idea is though, that we want to be able to figure out if we can induce this temporarily 
differently in other creatures that are closely related. So, okay, this is the thing that their ion channels are doing. Can we make this other closely related animal have the same effect? And then to you know, kind of extrapolate more broadly, is there a way we can use this to dull out human pain for things like surgery so we don't have to keep handing out OxyContin to everybody? Is there a way where we can use the dimming down of these ion channels to keep our own pain issues from coming up during things like routine surgery? So, very, very interesting. Article number two. New research shows that mutations in non-coding junk DNA can be the cause of ASD just as frequently as mutations in coding genes can. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is... Science! Choo-choo! So they did a really interesting test that involved advanced machine learning and started with a large sample of 1,800 people with ASD and their relatives without it. They then took genetic samples and let the machine scan all the results and look for commonalities and differences among the ASD population relative to their close relatives. What they found was that non-coding mutations in many of the children with autism altered the gene regulation. So we already knew, as we discussed before, that certain coding genes can be impacted that causes autism. What they're saying is it looks like for every one of those coding genes, we've also found a non-coding gene that can impact how the coding gene works that also causes autism. This is a huge discovery. Again, one of these things that fly under the radar because essentially what they've just said is we have doubled because they found almost the exact same amount. We have doubled doubled the amount of genetic cases of autism that we can find, or at least the, the causes of the genetic cases of autism that we can find. That's a really big deal. And they did this just by using advanced AI that could scan through all these genetics in the non-coding regions and notice similarities and differences between the sample group and the control group. Really, really cool way to do it. And really interesting because we all know that the nice thing about non-coding DNA, while it might not all be junk DNA as it's sometimes been called, the ability to do CRISPR-like modifications to non-coding DNA is much easier. You're much less likely to do something that kills you if you're going after non-coding DNA as opposed to coding DNA, which means that there might be a whole class of people with autism spectrum disorder out there that are treatable given current techniques because we can alter the genetic predisposition for that autism without affecting a coding region. I'm picturing a flowers for Algernon-like scenario mm -hmm. where uh, somebody slow after getting this gene therapy right, that, that, uh, that edits out the, the, yeah. the, uh, the ASD genes, they slowly go from maybe being somebody who spent a lot of time on the toilet but mm -hmm. was very good at math and sciences yes. to like subtly using the word bro in sentences Lots a lot. Lots of high fives. Testicles on his truck on the, on the trailer hitch. Super into motocross. Mountain Dew consumption goes through the roof. The study was actually probably funded by Big Dew. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be working at NASA like some nerd. Now I follow motocross around and crush pee on the reg, bro. <laughs> All right, article number three. New research suggests that different parts of your body follow their own circadian rhythms, including your liver that knows whether you are being exposed to light or not. Damien thinks this is true. Dr. Abel thinks this is false. And this one is Science. So this is really interesting. This was in a mouse model where they used a genetic knockout to eliminate the brain circadian rhythm and saw if the mouse's other organs still went through the normal circadian cycle. So your body actually goes through circadian cycles, right? A lot of people don't know this. It's not just, okay, I'm up at this time or down at this time. Your body kind of ramps up and goes down. It's one of the reasons that people who work off shifts tend to have a lot of issues. So your brain does this usually by cycling to light, and you can fool your brain. If you are in a, a dark room, you can turn the lights on and, and kind of alter your circadian rhythms. Well, what these researchers did is they noticed that different parts of your body have different circadian rhythms, and long for a long time we've thought, we actually think they're independent because of a few variables, because they're not always matched up so well. And so what they did is they used this genetic knockout to essentially take out the hypothalamus's ability to regulate circadian rhythms. And they found that both the liver and the skin went through their own circadian rhythms that could be controlled by allowing light to be like shown on different parts of the body. Very interesting stuff because you have to wonder how your liver figures out it's fucking light or not, right? How did your liver, your skin makes sense. Your skin has photocell receptors, that, kind of, that makes sense. Your liver, how does your liver figure it out? Like the only way is it's getting communications from something other than your brain because that one part of your hypothalamus is not functioning in these mice. So somehow your liver is getting cues as to when you are exposed to sun or not and going through its own circadian rhythms. Very interesting. Do they talk about how to adjust a particular part of the body's <laughs> circadian rhythm? Like, for example, I'd love to get my colon on a different schedule. Yes. Because I'm tired of it having to go to work for the first three hours of my shift, whatever job yes. it is, whatever. <laughs> First of all, it sounds like you might have ASD, just so you know. <laughs> You're spending three hours on the toilet. Yeah, it sounds like it's getting out of work syndrome. <laughs> and 
was really interesting because your liver actually will actually completely stop functioning at some point if you're not exposed to sunlight. But they were able to expose different parts of the body to sunlight and still have the liver respond, meaning it was picking up signals from not just one part of the body, but different parts of the body. So only when the mice were subject to constant darkness over all parts of their body did their liver's clock stop functioning altogether. That's super interesting. It so means, maybe the liver just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Well, maybe the liver takes cues from your skin or from your eyes or when from something. When I was something. pregnant, I would shine like flashlights into my belly. Oh, really? And then the, then the kid would swim towards it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Did so you? maybe it's like the liver. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe your liver is getting just that tiny bit of light yeah. through your skin and using that. Would the baby swim toward it? Would it say, turn that fucking light off, yeah. lady? Is it like it, was too, yeah, it, was, it had a broom, and it was just, yeah. I'm sleeping in here. Hey. <laughs> Ava didn't realize she was giving birth to a New Yorker. <laughs> hey, oh, I'm just dating here. So, okay, so what happens to people who like live in Barrow, Alaska or something? Yeah, or? no, it, it actually does throw up their circadian rhythms. There, There's a, a whole group in like Norway that they in, there's a company that invented these lights that you put on like the brim of your hat that's supposed to like shine light on you during the winter months during the daytime to try and keep your circadian rhythms normalized. But it's it's a major cause of depression and other things. Like we overlook it because we're here in Southern California. <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. Like you go outside for five minutes, yeah. you have all the sunlight you need, the vitamin D you need. We're, we're bombarded by sunlight. But there are places where sunlight's a real problem. Do the Inuit traditionally live in in, in areas that yeah. are? I yeah. mean, do do natives do natives who've had lived in these conditions for a long time do they have natural? You resistance? know, I'd be curious as to to know like what kind of resistance people evolve for that. I do know that scientists working in Antarctica, which we have one of our guest scientists on our show works in Antarctica, uh, sometimes they have sp special lights that essentially do UV during the day, but then regular uh, non UV during the nighttime, and it's to help sync your circadian rhythms and stuff because otherwise. Your body just doesn't know what's going on. It's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to eat or digest. It's actually, you know where it's a really big problem is blind people have a really hard time with their circadian rhythms because they literally, they don't see light. And so they have some problems with their photoreception. But their skin can feel light. Yes. Right yeah, in. yeah. So it's not an all, it's not an all encompassing thing, but it does. It so does they should all be nudist. Yeah. So you know what? Like... Hey, if you're blind, <laughs> go take your clothes off. Might as well. You know what? You're not vulnerable enough to sexual assault blind emic blinded sin. Or what if it's a great excuse? Like you've always wanted to be a nudist, but like, yeah. you know, you get some cop who's going to come up to you. Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I, I couldn't see going out to like just really yeah, yeah. patronize the blind. Yeah. <laughs> What if you do it like it's the emperor's new clothes? And you're like, what are you talking about? I'm wearing a fantastic suit of luxury silk. <laughs> At least that's what the guy told me <laughs> who I gave all my money to this morning. Now let me present to the school. Uh, and lastly, article number four, researchers have crossed a fungus with a spider's venom to try to kill mosquitoes. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science, meaning that for the first time in science faction history, I get to say these words. Congratulations, Damien, you have won! I call BS for the first time ever! Which is what I would be saying had Damien not changed his first answer, <laughs> disqualifying him for winning this particular episode. <laughs> You and son I, of a bitch. <laughs> I would have, I, I, I did that in your favor. I, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Damien. Did you cheat and it didn't end up well for you? Should we all be sorry for cheating, Damien? Oh, no. My attempts to screw over other people and help myself didn't work as they were supposed to. Oh, fine. I got, I got dominated by Dr. Ava. Dominated by Dr. Ava. Oh, and I did. The, I'm such the a The sad boy. thing is, Damien, all you had to do was keep your original answer. You actually would have won by two points if you would have just kept your original Original answer. I guess it was one to have my trivia groin stepped on. Yeah, absolutely. By Dr. Ava's <laughs> superior scientific knowledge. Yeah, you're like, this is less of I call BS and more BDSM at some point. <laughs> Uh, but, drawing blood. But indeed, this is true. So they used a fungus that infects mosquitoes, and they paired it up with a venom from the Blue Mountain Funnel Web Spider to create a creature that infects mosquitoes and poisons them to death. They took this fungus that already exists that infects mosquitoes already, and they basically engineered it to produce the same venom that this particular spider produces. And it was really neat because they were able to infect these mosquitoes and then kill them. So normally the fungus doesn't kill these mosquitoes, right? It's the vector, essentially, for the, the thing. So... They use the, the fungus to get in the door and then the, the venom to kill the thing off. I feel like I should get another point because I basically said that with my mosquito malaria. But, you know, oh, yeah, fungus <laughs> malaria. Yeah, yeah. But it has nothing to do with malaria. It's not a disease. It's well, actually the just mosquitoes a are both involved. You know, just, in, I, I, they are both involved in different ways. But, yeah. The six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I should, I, by six degrees of Kevin Bacon rule, I should get the point. But the thing that's really interesting about this is unlike a lot of pesticides and stuff, this is essentially 
geared toward just these mosquitoes. There is not another species that is susceptible to this fungus. And because the fungus is really specialized, we don't see it crossing boundaries. It exists in nature already. We don't see it crossing any boundaries and infecting other animals. So what But you, now that it's super useful, maybe it might. I mean, I don't know what you mean by super useful though, right? Like it's going to be useful for us to kill mm -hmm. those things, right? But like it doesn't somehow gain another vector by which it could infect something else. And so by doing this, you could just impact mosquitoes and not, you know, just completely kill all the insects that are around you. And they share it when they bone? The fungus? I mean, I don't know, actually. I, I think they just, like, spread it on their food and stuff. But, yeah, okay. well, let's just say that it's an you STD. You mean us? Yes. And then they spread this fungus yes. all over us? Yes. <laughs> Against Vito. Tell science I veto. But, yeah, let's call it, let's call it the uh, mosquito STD. They're not a really a social species, are they? Except in, like, Alaska. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty social there. All right. Thank you, audience, for joining us for Science Faction 332, where you learned about how to torture African mole rats, how non-coding DNA can cause autism just as much as coding DNA can, how different parts of your body follow their own circadian rhythms, and how a mosquito STD is our best hope of wiping them out. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction. 333. Mm, now, Dr. Ava, now correct my grammar. You've been listening to Science Function. Wait, that's not right.